is Marquinta King. I am an M3 here at uh, UTHSC. Um, I just got off of the road from Knoxville on my internal medicine rotation, so please uh, work with me. <laughs> um, so I'm here to talk to you about uh, PPP2 and PPP3 and where they are localized within, uh, uh, within uh, chlamydia. I have no, um, no disclosures. Okay, so first, why is chlamydia clinically relevant? Well, it's the, lead, it's the leading cause of sexually transmitted bacterial infections. And what's even more concerning is that infections in women are often asymptomatic. If these infections go untreated, serious reproductive consequences such as pelvic inflammatory disease, tubal, inf tubal infertil infertility, or ectopic pregnancies can develop. Currently, chlamydial, chlamydial infections are treated with broad-spectrum antibiotics, um, namely azithromy azithromycin or doxycycline as first-line uh, first treatment. The issues with using antibiotics is that although they clear the infection, women can develop bacterial vaginosis or vaginal candidiasis, also known as yeast infections, um, which... Um, so because so because the antibiotics disturb the natural flora in the vagina, which allows for disproportionate growth of yeast or other bacteria, uh, women's quality of life can be decreased. So moreover, the changes in these vaginal environments can make the can make it more susceptible to reinfection with chlamydia by chlamydia. In fact, about 20% of women treated for chlamydia make a follow-up doctor's appointment due to reinfection. Therefore, there's a need for therapeutics more specific to chlamydia so that this infection can properly be treated. Interestingly enough, chlamydia uniquely divides by budding, so we think the machinery used to, to achieve this type of division depends you depends on unique proteins that could serve as specific therapeutic targets. So let's talk about the chlamydia life cycle. So chlamydia, chlamydia is an obligate intracellular bacterium that has two forms. The first is an elementary body seen here in green. Not even sure if it's seen here in green. Um, which is infectious, but does not replicate. What you see here in purple is the reticulate body, which is not infectious, but can undergo uh, replication. So the replicative cycle goes like this. An elementary body infects a host cell via endocytosis. If multiple chlamydia infect the same cell, the phagosomes will fuse and form an inclusion body, which you can kind of see a better picture here. Elementary bodies enlarge and reorganize into reticulate bodies. They undergo their first cell division around 11 hours post-infection. As the inclusion matures, the reticulate bodies can grow, I'm sorry, the, the reticulate bodies can continue to multiply and begin to condense and reorganize back into elementary bodies around 24 hours post-infection. Eventually, the in Inclusion's increasing size causes the cell and the inclusion to lice, which releases the infectious elementary bodies to go and infect another cell. Here you can see the different steps of polarized chlamydial division compared to E. coli. As you can see, different, pro different proteins localized to the part of the mother cell where a bud will form during the first division here. Here, you can see that different the different localization patterns of key proteins at various stages of cell division here. I would like to point out the asymmetric, asymmetric nature of this division expanding from one pole of the cell. Now, if you compare that to E. coli, which uses the conventional way of dividing, also known as binary fission, grow big, split down the middle, um, chlamydia is fundamentally different. 
So why are these differences significant? To answer this question, we need to first uh, we need we first need a little bit of background about penicillin penicillin binding proteins. So peptidoglycan seen here, this blue ring at the septum, is an essential component of successful replication. It is composed of alternating disaccharide sugars that are attached via glycosidic linkages. These disaccharides have pentapeptide side chains that are cross-linked by transpeptidases known as penicillin, penicillin binding proteins or PBPs because of their sensitivity to penicillin. Penicillin binds to and inactivates PBPs covalently, which inhibits their catalytic function, which effectively kills the cell. Both PBB2 and PBB3 are expressed in chlamydia and E. coli. However, in E. coli, PBB2, here in red, is diffusely found in the bacteria sidewall, and PBB3 is found dispersed throughout the septum here in, in black. Inhibition of PBB3 halts cell, halts cell diffusion entirely. However, inhibition of PBB2 does not. One would expect that these PBPs would function in a similar fashion, uh, the same in chlamydia. However, they do not. Surprisingly, inhibition experiments here um, using mesilinam and piperacillin uh, PBB2 and 3 in chlamydia were found to affect the bacterium in a different manner than in E. coli. In chlamydia cells treated with PBB2 inhibitors, um, while cells treated with PBB3 inhibitors can initiate budding, but arrest at an early stage in the process. Therefore, it was our goal to determine the temporal and spatial distribution of PBB2 and 3 during various stages of budding, to see if they interact with peptidoglycan found at the septum. So to analyze these localization patterns, we took M-cherry PBB2 and M-cherry PBB3 fusions and introduced them into a plasmid. Wild-type chlamydia were transformed with these constructs that allowed for the inducible expression of fusion of these fusions by the addition of anhydro anhydrotetracycline. HeLa cells were infected with either M-cherry PBB2 or M-cherry PBB3 transformants at 18 hours post-infection. Anhydrotetracycline was then added to induce the expression of the, fug of the fusions. The chlamydia were then isolated from infected cells at 22 hours post-infection. The cells were then fixed to a slide and, lo and the localization of the fusions was, were determined by using conventional uh, epifluorescent microscopy. So here you can see that both PBB2 and PBB3 are found at the septum uh, between the mother and the daughter cell. From this data, we noted three key findings. The first is that the PBBPs are in a spot and not diffusely found like areas you see here in E. coli. The second is that PBB2 is found at the septum and not the sidewalls of the membrane like E. coli. The third is that the interconnection between chlamydial PBPs and peptidoglycan are fundamentally different from other bacterium, as you can see compared to the diffuse uh, dispersal of each PBP in the sidewall and septum of E. coli. This localization pattern made us wonder how the proteins in this spot are regulated and maintained, which prompted us to investigate MREC. MREC is a, known, is a protein known to regulate and organize PBB2 and shares the same, PBB, the same localization pattern as PBB2 in other bacteria. So we prepared a cherry fusion version of MREC to assess the same localization pattern in PBB2 to see if the same localization pattern in PBB2 held true in chlamydia. So here, in this third figure here, you can see that MREC is also located at the septum, which leads us to believe that PBB2 and 3 and MREC possibly interact and form a complex that mediates chlamydial cell uh, division. So regarding future regarding future uh, projects, we believe that chlamydia uh, PB, PBPs interact with peptidoglycan in a fundamentally different way than other bacteria. 
uh, and that they've possibly formed a septal divisome complex. We speculate that the divisome either moves around the peptidoglycan or it is pulling peptidoglycan through the complex and modifying it at the same time. Right now, we think the former is more plausible than the latter. However, we can use real-time imaging to assess how the dimosome is actually moving or interacting with the septum. As you can see, the components of the chlamydial divisome are localized. However, in E. coli, they are diffusely dispersed. Since the, since the uh, complex is a discrete area at the septum of the cell, we would like to assess the different proteins that make up the divisome, which could identify novel inter interactors of proteins with the divisome complex. So thank you all. I would like to uh, thank the Cox Lab for giving me the opportunity to do this important research. Do you all have any questions? No, it's the the um the broad spectrum um, type of antibiotics that are used. Um, those are the only ones to effectively clear the the infection as of right now. Mhm. Mm Right, right, because it just everything. Right, right. So it just kind of breeds the growth of organisms that can cause real problems. So the idea is to use these interactions, PBP, the penicillin, penicillin binding proteins, as a way to discover specific proteins that chlamydia um, has, because all bacteria have penicillin binding proteins. Um, so PBPs in itself, they they aren't really good targets, but hopefully, um, when we do these pull down studies will be able to identify other proteins that chlamydia has that other bacteria don't have. And those are the proteins that would be good candidates for um, pharma. Mm -hmm. 